Every so often in life, we find ourselves in awkward situations, moments when we know that we're vulnerable to being misunderstood or misconstrued or misrepresented. It happens to all of us. Well, today is one of those awkward moments in my life. Now, we're in the middle of a series we call the You Ask For It series. That's a series every year where we allow the congregation to choose the topics that we as pastors speak on. Now, the question we're addressing today is an awkward question. It's a question that I have heard many times over the years. It's a question that, that has been asked in many different ways over the years. It's a question about the church and money. For example, people ask, with all the scandals around TV evangelists and preachers living in mansions, what really goes on behind the scenes when it comes to churches and money? Specifically, what goes on behind the scenes at Broadway Church? Why does Broadway Church pass offering bags around every week? And what does Broadway Church do with the money that people place in those offering bags every week? People are asking these questions, and I'm quite happy to actually answer those questions. However, in answering these questions, I place myself in the awkward position of talking about money. And people have told me for years that they hate it when pastors talk about money. So do you see the dilemma? Do you see the awkwardness? It's like I'm being asked to talk about money without actually talking about money. Well, the good news is that this is the very reason why I started doing the You Asked For It series over 30 years ago. The You Asked For It series is an opportunity for a congregation to make sure their pastor addresses the topics that that pastor might otherwise try to avoid. And that's what we're doing today. So let's be clear. We're talking about money because you asked for it. Now, if you're tempted to tune me out because of the topic, let me quickly challenge you. I'm about to say something that is perhaps quite bold, but please hear me out before you decide to tune me out. I'm about to explain to you the reasons why this church receives offerings and what this church does with the offerings it receives. If you decide to tune me out before hearing the reasons, you will have abandoned the right to criticize churches when it comes to money. Because by tuning me out before hearing me out, you are exposing a deeper truth. By tuning me out before hearing me out, you are revealing what is really going on inside of you. By tuning me out before hearing me out, you are showing that deep down, you don't really fear that churches love money. You are showing that deep down, you love money. So if you sincerely want to know why we receive offerings, and if you sincerely want to know what we do with the offerings we receive, I invite you to take the next 20 minutes to peek with me behind the financial curtain of Broadway Church. And in doing so, I hope to not just inform you about the process and the people behind the scenes, I also hope to inspire you with the purpose and the potential when it comes to giving to God. Well, with that in mind, let's dive right into the questions that you're asking. Why do we give money to God's church? And what happens to the money after we give it? Well, let's start with the why. Why do we give money to God through the church? Well, at Broadway Church, we give money to God for three main reasons. Our giving is grounded upon three main pillars of truth. First of all, we give to God because we believe that every person was created to experience and express the purest love imaginable. Now, as we know very well here at Broadway Church, in English, we have one word for love, and that is the word love. And that word covers a whole vast territory. I love my wife. I love my family. I love uh, my car. I love my country. I love the Toronto Maple Leafs. I love M&Ms. I have all sorts of loves in my life. So does that provide me with a moral dilemma? In English, it's kind of difficult to differentiate between all the various loves in our lives. But the ancient Greeks, they solved this dilemma. They had four essentially distinct words for love. There's eros, which is the ancient Greek word for where we get our word erotic. It's for romantic love. And then they had the word phylos, which is the word for friendly love, love between friends. And then storge, which is the word for family love or patriotic love. And then there was the fourth, 
and the highest level of love, agape love. That's the ancient Greek word for the unconditional love, for the purest love imaginable. And this is the word that God used to describe himself in scripture. One of the scripture writers wrote, God is agape love. God is the purest love imaginable. And you were created, as you read scripture, you were created to live in the continual eternal presence of agape love with the God whose very nature is agape love. So this truth lies at the heart of everything that we do. You were created to experience and express the purest love imaginable. You say, well, how does that truth lead us to give money? That's where the second pillar comes into play. We give to God because secondly, we believe that the mission of the church of Jesus Christ is to lead people to Christ-centered living. Okay, well, what does that mean and how does it connect? Although we were created to experience the purest love imaginable, the truth is that we're not living this experience. We're not living this reality. The truth is that we have become separated from what we were created to be. How we were designed to live as human beings and how we're actually living as human beings are two very different things. I don't have to tell you this. I mean, you intuitively know this. Deep inside of you, there's a longing, a yearning, a desiring that nothing on this earth is able to fulfill. Deep inside of you, you recognize that you were made for something more than what this world can offer you. We were created, you were created to experience and express the purest love imaginable. But the truth is that we've been separated from what we were created to experience. And that's where Christ comes in. Jesus Christ came to restore us to what we were created to be. One of the authors of scripture put it this way. Salvation is found in no one else speaking of Jesus, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Well, saved from what? Saved from our, our sin, saved from our rebellion. See, that's why Jesus came. We had this huge gap between what we were created to be and what we actually are. And that gap was created by our rebellion, by our waywardness, by our sin. And so we have fallen short from what God designed us to be. We've separated ourselves from the God who created us, the God who wants to have relationship with us. So Jesus came to do what you and I could never do. He came to bridge that ga gap. He came to pay our moral debt. He came to pay the wages that our sin have brought into our lives. And so he died in our place because the wages that sin pays is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Jesus paid our moral debt and then he offers us as a gift eternal life and forgiveness and a restoration to what we were designed to be, to reconnect with the purest love imaginable. You see, salvation is a gift that we receive. It's not a goal that we achieve. So the only way to fully experience the purest love imaginable is through trusting in the saving and restoring work of Jesus Christ. And the church is the body of people that God has tasked with communicating the message and completing the mission of Christ on earth. The mission of the church is to lead people to Christ-centered living, to bring them to Christ, and then to have them learn what it is to follow Christ. And that's what Broadway Church is all about. That's why we have all the ministries that are under the umbrella of Broadway Church, from our children's ministries to nursery to our Sunday school to, to our youth groups and young adult groups to our every adult ministry you can imagine, from all of our Bible studies, from our services and all of our many campuses to our outreach ministries to our grief share for our Celebrate Recovery Ministries, helping people with hurts, habits, and hangups, our Genesis Recovery groups, helping people who are stuck in life, our divorce care groups, all our city reach ministries where we feed thousands of homeless people every week and minister to people in every type of need that they have, our healing ministries, our prayer, our recovering ministries. I'm just scratching the surface. I'm missing so many ministries that I could be listing. But every one of these ministries is staffed by people and requires buildings and, and assets to, to enable them to take place. So we give money to fuel these efforts and to fuel 
enable these ministries. We give money so that everyone can be restored to what they were created to be. We give money so that everyone can live according to God's design for their lives. We give money so that everyone can live a Christ-centered life. We give money so that everyone can experience and express the purest love imaginable. And this brings us to the third foundational pillar regarding why we give money to God through his church. As followers of Jesus Christ, we acknowledge and live the truth that we are managers, not owners, of the resources in our life. You see, when it comes to the money in our pockets and the possessions in our hands, we, as followers of Christ, see things differently than the world around us. As followers of Jesus Christ, we acknowledge and live the truth that we are managers, not owners, of the resources in our life. We acknowledge that God owns it all. Everything belongs to him. Now, as a response to this, in the Old Testament, God's people were commanded to give 10% of their income back to God as an act of obedience and worship. In the New Testament, we go above that. In the New Testament, we're commanded to be generous with our income as an act of obedience and worship. That's why we give money to God. We are not merely taking our money and giving it to God. Here, it's ours, and we'll give you a little bit. We're not tipping God. No, it was never our money to begin with. It was always God's money. So when we give money to God through his church, we're obeying God, we're acknowledging God's ownership, we're worshiping God, and we're fueling God's mission all at the same time. Okay, so let's review. Why do we give money to God? Because we believe that every person was created to experience and express the purest love imaginable. And we believe that the only way to fully experience the purest love imaginable is through trusting in the work of Jesus Christ. And we believe that the church has been tasked with communicating the message and completing the mission of Christ on earth. And as followers of Christ, we acknowledge and live the truth that we're managers, not owners, of the resources in our life. So that answers the why when it comes to giving money. Now let's touch on the what. So what happens to the money after people give it? I mean, how can a person who gives money through Broadway Church know that the money is being spent and invested properly and with integrity? I love the story of the picnic. It was a, a church picnic. And so there's this long table full of food. And everybody, it was like a potluck. Everybody brought some food and placed it on these long tables. And you went with your plate and you walked down the table and you picked what you wanted off of the table. So at one point, there was this huge plate of chocolate and vanilla cupcakes. And, but there was a little sign in front of the plate that said, please take only one cupcake. God is watching. And then as you walk down a little further, there's another plate full of chocolate chip cookies. And there is a sign that said, you can have as many cookies as you want. God's watching the cupcakes. <laughs> we realize that God can watch both, don't we? Well, did you know that God is watching when we give money? It's true. In one of the first century biographies of Jesus that are included in the Bible, we call them Gospels, a man named Mark records an event from the life of Jesus that people rarely talk about. It's recorded in Mark chapter 12, starting at verse 41. Look what it says right in the beginning. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put, and he watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Now pause there for a second. Jesus stops, he pauses, and he's watching people as they're giving money in the temple. See, there's a special place where you came and you dropped your money into these containers. And what does Jesus do? He stops, sits across from this place, leans in, and he's just watching. Can you imagine me during offering time following and ushered along each aisle and watching as people put money in the bags? You'd think, well, Darren's got some money issues, doesn't he? This is exactly what Jesus does. And then he calls his disciples over to him and he says, hey, watch something, gang. Let's keep reading the passage. It says, many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, 
Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. Why? Because they gave out of their wealth, but she gave out of her poverty. She put in everything, all she had to live on. See, Jesus was saying, relatively speaking, I mean, these rich people gave a lot of money and wonderful, he wasn't condemning them, but he's saying, don't think because this poor widow only put in a couple pennies that she didn't give anything to God. He was saying, relatively speaking, she actually gave more. She gave everything she had. But what I want us to notice is this. Jesus is paying careful attention when it comes to the giving of money. You see, at Broadway Church, we are fully aware of this reality. At Broadway Church, we are fully aware that just as God is watching the cupcakes and the cookies, he's also watching the giving and the receiving of money. Meaning, God doesn't just pay attention to who is doing the giving, God also pays attention to what we do with the money after it's been given, after we've received it. And this actually brings us to today's big idea where we sum up today's teaching. Here it is. At Broadway Church, we handle every penny that is given with the understanding and the awareness that God is watching us. At Broadway Church, we handle every penny that is given with the knowledge that it does not belong to us, but it belongs to God. And we as church leaders are accountable to God for how we handle his money. That's why at Broadway, we handle every penny that is given with the understanding and the awareness that God is watching us. And that's why over the 112 years of our history as a congregation, we have created systems to ensure that every penny is accounted for and spent in the wisest way possible, by the wisest people possible, in the most transparent way possible. Now, to help you get a better picture of what takes place behind the financial curtain at Broadway, I recently invited the two individuals who play the largest roles when it comes to finances in this congregation, and I invited them to answer some questions. Bruce Wong and Shelley Clifford are the individuals I'm talking about. Now, Bruce is a chartered accountant who serves on our board and is the treasurer of Broadway Church. Shelley is a full-time staff member here at Broadway who serves as the director of finance and human resources here. Every penny that is given to God through Broadway Church passes through the hands and through past the eyes of these two individuals. Two individuals who have called Broadway Church their home for many decades. Now, I recently took the opportunity to sit down with these two very busy people in order to ask them some behind the financial curtain questions when it comes to money and Broadway Church. It was just a couple minutes, but let's watch it together. So Shelly and Bruce, I need you to get right to the point. You're both intelligent people. You've got the information at your fingertips and I wanna do this as succinctly as possible. So I'm gonna ask you some quick questions and do your best to answer them quickly. So here we go. So when a person watching invests their hard-earned money into Broadway Church, where does it go? Well, we have three main funds. The first one is missions funds, which funds every dollar that comes in goes to support our global workers, national missions or international missions. And we have a global outreach committee that oversees that fund. So every dollar in, is a dollar out. So that's given through Broadway more than to Broadway. That's correct. The second one is our building fund. Our building fund um, is every dollar given goes towards debt reduction or capital asset purchase. So some of you may remember in 2018, we had a massive building program, uh, the refurbishment of the walls outside, and that was $5 million. So we are now down to uh, $717,000 on our debt, and we are trying hard to get that down. And third... So we've got missions and we've got building fund. Yes, and general fund. And the general fund is what fuels the missions and ministries of Broadway Church and all the infrastructure. Pays for staffing and maintenance and repairs of the buildings, utility costs. It subsidizes the ministries of Broadway Church. 
Um, that's as the you big know, one in Broadway? The that's, yeah, that's the big one. So Broadway has three campuses. So we have the Vancouver campus, the Warehouse campus, and the Port Coquitlam campus. So there's we have to maintain and take care of those buildings. As well, when the pandemic started, uh, we started the online church. And so there were uh, initial hard costs to set that up. We had to buy some equipment, but there are now ongoing soft costs to keep that you know, uh, producing the services every single week. Well, that's week. essentially four campuses. Four campuses, and then this fall we're launching this September uh, the Surrey campus. So, as you can appreciate, over the last five years, God has really blessed Broadway with allowing us to expand our ministries. But along with expanding the ministries, our general fund expending has gone from two and a half million dollars to now three and a half million dollars. Right. So, it's so important for the congregation to continue to give faithfully to the general fund, to give their offerings and tithes to the storehouse, as mentioned in Malachi. Okay, Bruce, I'm going to ask you an awkward question, but this is an awkward topic today, admit so thousands of people call Broadway Church their home. Thousands of people attend Broadway Church. So can people assume that thousands of people are giving money every week to Broadway Church? Well, the reality is here at Broadway, we have about a thousand giving units. Now a giving unit can be a family or, or an individual, but the point is a giving unit is a unit that gives regularly to Broadway Church. And we have about a thousand of those. Okay, a thousand. So. <laughs> Of these thousand people, they're all kind of giving the same, basically, or they're, they're a thousand people who are faithfully giving a significant amount of money, right? Well, no, uh, the facts say that um, a significant portion of our revenue comes from a relatively small portion of those giving units. For example, in 2021, roughly 55%, so over half of our general fund revenue came from only 8% of our giving units. Okay, stop. I don't think I heard you. 55% of our income comes from 8% of our givers? That's right. And the corollary is, is that there's a larger portion of our giving base that gives relatively less to our general fund. So for example, again in 2021, roughly 62% of our giving base, of our giving units, gave less than $2,500 to our general fund. And even more than that, just slightly under half of our giving units gave less than a thousand dollars to general fund. Wow, so those are the things we have to factor in when we budget. That's right. Okay, there you go. So these people who give to Broadway Church, they've placed their money, it's in these three funds. So who decides how that money then gets spent? It's one thing to give it to a fund. Who decides how that fund is dispersed? Well, let me tackle that one in the in the order that Shelley presented them. First, the missions fund, uh, as Shelley said, that's under the direction of the Global Outreach Committee. Secondly, the building fund, the majority of that goes toward paying down our debt. And as Shelley mentioned, that's been a financial priority for us. And as God has blessed us, we've been able to reduce that debt significantly over the past few years. And that brings me to the big piece, the yes, general fund. The general fund. Now, every year we go through a, a rigorous process of uh, preparing budgets for both the general fund and all the departmental ministries. Okay, so how are budgets done at Broadway? So Shelley and I will take a first cut at, at that budget, putting together a spending budget, and we'll take into account various factors. For example, strategic ministry directions and decisions that come from you, Darren, and the church board, not only for the coming year, but for, for, for the many years, uh, looking ahead for many years. Uh, we'll also look at anticipated costs related to maintaining all those facilities that Shelley mentioned. And we'll also look at any planned uh, capital investment uh, purchases. So we'll put together that spending budget. And once that's done, we'll measure it against last year's giving revenue. And we'll also look at the year to year trend in that giving revenue. And the purpose of that, of course, is to assess whether the anticipated revenue will be sufficient to cover our operating expenses because we are, after all, not for profit. Right. Okay. As a result of that process, inevitably, there are revisions that will be required to the budget. And as you know, Darren, we involve you yes. in that process. Yeah. Okay. After that, the budget then goes to the Finance and Audit Committee for their review and their feedback. And that will usually result in even more revisions to, to the annual budget. So who's this Finance and Audit Committee? Well, the Finance and Audit Committee is comprised of individuals. That's not the board. No, it's not although two board members do sit on that committee. Okay. 
These are individuals with significant levels of financial and business experience and expertise and who are deeply committed to Broadway Church. So these are chartered accountants, CFOs, CEOs, and so on, right? right? Within right. our congregation. That's right. Okay. So this Finance and Audit Committee will review the budget that we put together, put, enter, give us feedback on it, and then once they've given their thumbs up on that budget, it then goes to the uh, church board for their review and ultimately their final approval. All in all, it's a time-consuming process, as Shelley will attest to. Right. Mm -hmm. But once it's complete, we have the comfort of knowing that it's gone through several layers of review and has had several sets of qualified eyes look at it. So once a budget's set, it's done, and we just go with it for the whole year, what if things aren't panning out like we anticipated? Well, this has happened in the past, as you know, Darren, yeah. when, when we, as we monitor our performance against that budget, if it's not uh, measuring up, uh, measuring up well, we are prepared to uh, make cuts to our annual operating costs. Okay, so we've got the budgets, we've got these committees and so on. So how can a person know that their money is being spent wisely and with integrity? What, what are the layers of accountability at Broadway Church? Well, in my role as Director of Finance, I've been involved in the finances of Broadway for over 38 years. And so anybody knows me and knows I'm passionate about ensuring that we steward the funds well. So honestly, every dollar given to Broadway, um, I oversee uh, the expenses. Uh, there is no dollar that is spent without my signature on it. Now you're exaggerating. That's hyperbole, right? Every dollar? Every dollar. Every dollar. Every dollar. Yeah, wow. so okay. I sign off on it before it goes to uh, to be prepared uh, for a check. Once the checks are prepared, then Bruce as the treasurer reviews all of them as well and signs off on them. So every dollar has not just you signing off, you as well, two layers of accountability. And an additional second signing off. A third layer of accountability for every dollar. For every dollar. Every dollar. Every dollar. Okay. That's, that's, that's impressive, but okay, keep going. Yeah. Um, as well, at the end of each month, I print off department reports, and so I review all the ministries uh, reporting every single month to make sure that they are actually spending within their approved budget. And if they get the little red X, that little red X means they're gonna be having a meeting with me yes. to have a correction in their spending habits. Uh, and then after, at the end of each month, I also write a financial report and a summary of the financial statements, and I review those with Bruce every single month. Yes, and of course, part of the most important part of that review, it, Darren, is uh, for us to monitor how we're doing against that that budget that we spent so much time and effort uh, preparing earlier in, in the process. And as as we mentioned, if we're not performing well against that budget we will make cuts. Make adjustments. Make cut, mm -hmm. cuts well. So you're checking every dollar, you're checking every dollar, and then there's a third layer check. Then you two get together every month to see where we're at. Yes, and, and then beyond that, those annual, those monthly reports, I should say, uh, once they're prepared, uh, they get sent to both the Finance and Audit Committee and the Church Board. Now, the Church Board, as you know, Darren, uh, financial review is part of every single board meeting. Mm -hmm. Plus, they're ultimately responsible for both the approval of that annual church budget that we talked about and the annual audited financial statements. An annual audited financial statement. So that's something we do in-house? No, no. That's an additional le level of financial accountability here at Broadway. We have an external auditor, currently the firm of Matt and Elliott, who annually performs an audit of our financial statements. And in the course of doing so, also reviews our internal financial controls. So is this like they come in for an afternoon? Or? I wish. No, so <laughs> it's usually three to four weeks. That three to four takes, weeks. Yeah, it takes them a number of number of weeks. They go very detailed, and again, they do risk assessments on our on our controls to make sure that we're doing things well. And we do that every year. That's right. And those annual audited financial statements are reviewed and approved by both the church's finance and audit committee and the church board, and lastly, are presented to the membership at the annual general meeting. So anybody as a member can look at the books if they want to. That's right. Wow. So there you have it, folks. Behind the curtains look at the finances at Broadway Church. Thank you for the work you two do. Well done. So there you have it, folks. A peek behind the financial curtain at Broadway Church. All because you asked for it. Today, you've been given a glimpse at the why and the what when it comes to giving at Broadway Church. 
At Broadway, we are motivated to give by the purest love imaginable, as expressed through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're motivated to steward what is given by the knowledge that every penny belongs to God and God is watching how we handle His resources. It's my hope and my prayer that this why and this what not only helps but also inspires you to be as generous as God wants you to be. Knowing that when you give to God through Broadway Church, you are giving through a place that respects you, that honors God, and is making an eternal difference in the world around us. Let's pray together as we conclude today. God, I thank you that you are agape love. You are the, a being who is the purest love imaginable. But you're also a God who is holy and a God who is true and a God who is just. And all of those attributes, all of that reality came together in the person of Jesus Christ, in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. You loved us, yet you had to be just and true when it came to our sin and our rebellion against you. So you paid our debt. You made a way for justice to be fulfilled and love to be experienced through Jesus' sacrificial life, death, and resurrection. And if you're watching today and you've not yet experienced or accepted this gift of God's forgiveness in your life, I'm gonna give you a chance to do that right now. Pray with me. God, I acknowledge my rebellion. I acknowledge that I am not experiencing the purest love of manageable in my life. My life has gone off the rails. I'm living a wayward, rebellious life. I don't wanna live this way anymore. I wanna live according to your design. So I acknowledge my rebellion and I accept your gift of forgiveness and eternal life as offered through the person of Jesus Christ. Come into my life, fill me with your spirit, change me from the inside out from this day forward. And give me the courage now to tell somebody about this decision that I've made. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, on the screen right now is a number you can text. And you can text and say, hey, I made a decision to follow Jesus. And someone will respond to your text by helping you take some next steps in your journey. No, don't worry, we're not tricking you. We're not gonna harass you or hound you or put you on a mailing list. We'll just text you back and offer any help that we can in helping you take the next step in your journey towards a Christ-centered life. God bless you. Thank you for being with us at Broadway Church today.